the first person that has to go forward, you know, and pave the way to say, hey, I believe in this idea is you. So you have to walk the walk and talk the talk until you can get other people on board. What I did, was determined about was that it wouldn't take too long. But I knew that to build a lasting legacy, to do something that I would be proud of, that I can say to my daughter, hey, look at what I did. I needed to commit not only my time and my energy, but my money. So that was the angle that I looked at it from. So in a way, I did whatever needed to be done to set the network up. Welcome to Third Culture Africans, the lifestyle podcast for dreamers, thinkers, and doers. We celebrate artistry, share stories from those brave enough to create something and succeed, listen to diverse perspectives on African success, and those shifting the needle on culture. I'm Zezo Ariaki Sal, your host. On this week's episode of Third Culture Africans, my guest is Aduke Onafowokan. She is passionate about corporate social responsibility and teaching. She is building a future and her personal strengths and is prioritizing parenting while doing it. She's an incredibly inspiring and open character, and I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did tackling the various subjects that we did. Hi, Aduke. Thank you so much for joining us on this week's episode of Third Culture Africans. Thank you for having me, Zizi. We're having such great weather at the moment that we were discussing allergies before we went on air. <laughs> but Aduke, if I get this right, you are a international speaker, a diversity and inclusion consultant with your company Inclusivity. And prior to that, you were a project manager. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is me. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. Well, you and I met, oh, I forgot sister, sister. So you and I <laughs> met, how could I have done that when actually how that's how I met you? So you and I <laughs> met, I don't know how you found me, yeah. but you had reached out for one of your sister sister uh -huh. sort of what do you call them seminars yeah so we we had that one in reading i think it was 2018 yes and yes. you had reached out and asked if i would be happy to showcase and share my mm -hmm. um, entrepreneurial journey and there was a showcase after with brands etc and for people to engage and that's how we got to know each other mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. over the years we've kind of kept in touch mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you are now doing lots of amazing things oh, and I'll you. let you share a lot more about all the amazing things that you do but I guess starting from like, maybe early days I guess you're originally Nigerian yep and to be fair for a long time you were straddling sort of nine to five five yes. to nine life mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I would love for us to talk a lot about just your transition right yeah from that into now and how you were able to cope with with doing both right because I think for most people in careers or in jobs who have entrepreneurial pursuits you know when is the right time to devote to your passion or your business versus you know devoting to the career that you know you've studied for and are trying to build so early you, how, like, your journey beginnings. <laughs> oh, right, okay, I'll try and remember everything. <laughs> but I um, was born in Yola, as in northern Nigeria. My dad worked for the then NEPA PHCN. So Stop we moved it. around a lot, like, yes. literally. I think I'm one of the few people who has lived in the north the north part, uh, northern part of Nigeria, the south, the west, and then the east as well, because we had a little stint in a boy amazing so i was running yola and then shortly after i was born my mom had to go back to school so i was then sent to the village in kogi state where i lived with my aunt till i was about five so i grew up in the village <laughs> um, with my <laughs> lovely aunt my mom's sister is kind of like yes. a big mommy to me um so were your parents young when they had you like were they like a young couple yes ish um but they got married really early so even though I'm not the first I'm the third but my mom had her first child at 19 so as of the time she had had me she was still kind of like 27 
So she was still trying to juggle, finishing school. My dad had finished, you know, he was already just starting his career at that time as an engineer in Nigeria. At that time, we obviously, you know, it was quite, you know, competitive in a way because he had to devote himself to, to work and all of that. So my mom kind of, so the three of us were taken back to live in the village, but my big sister, my elder sister, my brother lived with my grandma my mom's dad and and then I was taken to live with my aunt because I was younger and my aunt is younger as well so and she had more energy younger. basically yeah so they just thought <laughs> actually my grandma can't cope with this nine month old baby so oh, wow so you were nine months yes I was nine months when I went to live with my um but it was really good for me because they were a slightly elderly couple they had wanted to apparently have another child after their last daughter but they they didn't manage to so they were looking for someone to spoil so i was lacking nothing i look at all the pictures of myself when i was growing up in the village i was like oh my god this is the best childhood anyone happiness personified i had everything honestly and even now when i still go back home when i go back home to my heart my aunt's house it's like i can do I can get away with anything because I'm like the last one in that family. And you can imagine all our kids are like in their 40s and 50s. So I'm the baby of the house. Yeah, the baby baby. Unfortunately, we, we lost my uncle uh, three years ago. Oh, no. and that's a loss I'm we're still that. trying to um, come to terms with. But um, so that, that was sort of how I started. And when I was five, my mom had moved back. Uh, my dad, my mom had finished her teacher's training and my dad was now uh, an area manager. So it was, they were kind of like on the come up. <laughs> and yes. they had settled um, at, um, in Ilefe at that time. So they felt, okay, now is a good time to move the kids. So they had moved my brother and my sisters the year before. Yeah. My aunt didn't want me to go. So they were still kind of, you know, um, baiting. Hanging that. on. So in yeah. the end, my dad was just like, he had to take forceful action and say I had to go. So I found myself in Ile Fair and I was, I was probably about to turn six. Mm-hmm. And, and then... All of a sudden, I was attending OAU staff school. I was with all these kids, and it's like, oh my god, I could, I don't even speak English. <laughs> 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 so um, yeah, that was like an adjustment. I can't remember most of it, but obviously, there's so many stories my mom tells. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then yeah, then we I grew up in Ife. I attended OAU staff school. From OAU staff school, I went to um, a school called Ambassadors College in Ife. Again, mm-hmm. I can't remember most of this because my education was quite fast. I went mm. to secondary school just before I turned nine. So a lot of these wow. kind of things are like blurs in my, you know. So hold on. So from barely speaking English at six, yeah, finishing secondary school, um, primary school, primary school to, to mm-hmm. enter secondary school by the time yep. you're nine apparently when i was in primary four and then i just tried my common entrance and i hazed it so they just moved me wow on. <laughs> incredible so i then then my parents my dad then got a, a really good opportunity within nepa again and we had to move to abeokuta so again we packed a lot of bags and then i went to a school called alabalos in royal college which actually sort of one, you know, really key part of my journey because that's why I met a woman called Mrs. Lossing. I really, really admire. She was, she's the owner of the school. She, she was at that time the yellow day of Ibalan and she was just like really strong. Her nails were always done. She loved jewelry. She was strict, you know, and I just love, love, love her. So I did my secondary school. Again, my education was quite fast. I finished secondary school just as I was about to turn 15. And then I was meant to go to Ibinedon University. Oh, stop. I went to, for the first few years, did you? Um, well, Ibinedon Education <laughs> Centre. <laughs> well, I didn't, actually, because my dad second, um, started having second thoughts because I was so young about me just being on my own. He had heard so many stories. Again, you know. in a different state. You mm-hmm. know how it is. So in the end, my dad was like, okay. My dad at that time had left Abel Kutai. was now working in, in the north again. He was mm-hmm. in my degree. So it was just basically like, you know what, let, let us go to university of my degree. It's a federal university. I'm there. We've got loads of friends. So overnight, again, I find myself in the north, you know, studying law, <laughs> listening to all these outside people. And Hold I don't understand a word. <laughs> but did you have any aspirations, like in terms of like 
law degree etc um, because you you went on to nottingham school of law so yeah i kind of add those asp- well, they weren't really mine like everybody because i had this extrovert personality and i did quite a lot of stuff while i was in secondary school i was always debating here doing this award doing that so i think people just were oh she's gonna be a great lawyer so there was never really a room for that conversation it was just like yes i'm going to be a great lawyer so i just kind of went with it and remember i was just turning 15 i turned 15 in year one so it wasn't like i knew what I wanted or I had those kind of, I just, I kind of thought I might do music as well. So I, I, I dabbled into music along the line somewhere. Oh, wow. I know it was very adventurous. You know? <laughs> I did all sorts of things, to be honest. I formed a band and all of that. So I, um, I then just went and studied law and, and that took five years to study, to study law. I met some really amazing friends and people. By the time I finished my degree, my and when I went to law school in Lagos, I already kind of knew I wasn't going to practice because I didn't have that natural affinity. Like people were like, you know, getting all worked up about moot court, and I was just like, okay, <laughs> oops, <laughs> you know, people were so passionate and stuff, and I couldn't really see a lot of that passion in myself. So as soon as I was finishing law school, I said to my parents, I want to go to Lagos Business School. And I want to go and do a degree and just see, well, some course and just see what else is there outside law. Because clearly, you know, something is missing. So I then went to Lagos Business School and there my mind just really opened up to different possibilities. I met some really interesting Nigerian professionals who are doing quite a lot of things with their lives. And I was like, oh, so that's a career line. And I was like, okay, so it's still a lot of confusion and at that time I just went okay that was a good experience to go through so at this point you're you're 20 just about yeah I'm budget just 20 just shy of 20 and then my dad and you know we thought okay the best thing for me to do maybe just go and do my master's degree so actually I was going to South Africa to do my master's degree so I, I got an admission at Johannesburg but then the old xenophobic attacks and all of that kind of started so my parents said well just wait another year and I was like no I don't want to wait another year I'm just gonna go to the UK um because a lot of my friends at that time anyways were doing their masters in the UK so there was quite a lot of you know people I knew in the UK already so I came into the UK went straight to Nottingham where I did my master's degree in law again obviously I didn't I I kind of but what I did yeah just following the road they've already paved yes but I tried Mm -hmm. to do it in international trade and corporate law because I felt like based on my experience at Lagos Business School I quite like that old business centric kind of thing and I was going to go back home actually I was never going to stay in the UK in terms of my Mm. plan after my master's, I was offered a scholarship to start a PhD. So I started my PhD um, in corporate social responsibility, talking what well, my research was around, you know, CSR before CSR became a thing, right? Mm, and I was yeah. kind of sampling the oil and gas industries and, you know, the model in Mexico and all of that. So everything was kind of like, yeah, I'll do that. And then I'll go back to Nigeria because my dad kind of worked a bit in oil and gas. So I thought I'll be able to find a job in some sh- big shop firm with my dad or whatever. Around that time, my dad felt a bit ill. So it was kind of a lot of challenges back at home. And then I was just in the UK, you know, just doing my PhD, wondering what the hell am I going to do? I want to lecture and all that. And then I met a boy. Ah, (laughs) The the hour is the problem. Yep. (laughs) So I met my husband. He's, um, you know, I'm not even going to get into that, but it was such a jaggedy jaggala on on likely scenario. But we met each other we actually met a year before but at that time it just felt like another person i knew if i was even calling him you know because i'm yoruba now we're always calling each other i mom and brother me i was calling my brother my husband big brother at that time you know he's calling uncle uncle Olu. oh goodness me <laughs> the people that know us <laughs> you, still, you married people uncle that know us deeply they always say ah uncle Olu, you know so i knew for a year and it was just at the back of my mind like this one big brother somewhere you know um and then I, I remember i I was going to Nigeria because I went. I used to go back and home a lot. So I was going back one time and then it randomly calls me and I'm just like, yeah, what's up? And he's like, yeah, good to get in touch. I was like, ah, unfortunately, I'm traveling tomorrow or something like that. But I will contact you when I'm coming back and then we'll see where we take you from there. And then 
I, he was like, yeah, just call me when you get to Nigeria, right? So I was like, okay, that's fine. That's Nigeria. And then he just started calling me every day, <laughs> you know? <laughs> we were just chatting and chatting. So by the time I came back after like a month, he picked me up from the airport and the rest is history. But what then happened was I got pregnant. Oh, wow. Uh, and, uh, so yeah. then it's a question of, do you carry on with your PhD or what do you your then PhD do? PhD or exactly mm-hmm. that. And because I was kind of already not quite sure if I wanted to even do this PhD, to be fair. And then just add on top of that the stress of just being pregnant. And also at that time, as my sister used to say, I had spent probably a decade in education. So I was overwhelmed. I had gone from school to school to school to school to school. And I'd never actually paused to actually ask myself, what do I want to do? So I took two years off my PhD just as I would, I mean, if, I don't do a lot. Of, I don't regret a lot of things. But one of the things I wish I could have done differently was I could have just finished my MPhil because the way the PhD set up you do the m field first and then you get a phd i was just about to cross over from m field to phd when i paused so I, at first i took a two-year break and within that two years we got married and i moved to Reading where my husband had been sort of leaving before then and then we um then one of his friends introduced me to project management and said, oh, okay, you'd be really great at project management. I was like, well, okay, all right. This is another thing somebody thinks I'm going to be really great at. <laughs> okay, yeah. let's give it a go. <laughs> Turns out, actually, but then, I really enjoyed it. But then you're contracting straight off the bat or you take, yes. you take a so job? So I took a job-ish for about a year um, just to sort of get into the scheme of things um, and see if I enjoy it kind of stuff. And as soon as I felt, oh, man, you know, I actually don't mind this. And it's something to, you know, I, I just went straight to contracting. So I started contracting quite early on in my career. Um, and I've never looked back. But why why the decision to be a contractor as opposed to, like, a full-time well, employee? Well, there are two things. One, my first boss, who is amazing, Fiona, was retiring. And Fiona taught, taught me everything I know basically about project management. She was my first project program manager. And I learned quite a lot in the one year that I worked with her. And so I felt quite confident when um, she was retiring that I wanted to just go and do my own thing. But also, I'm not really... At that time, I didn't feel that I was very diplomatic enough to handle the politics of permanent employment. I don't know if that makes sense. Like, I just the, or I, I just wanted to do my job, get paid and leave. Like, I didn't really feel like I was going to be that perfect employee person who would be able to, you know, do all of the things you have to do. So, and then obviously there was also the fact that I felt because I had not quite finished my PhD or go to practice law. I wanted something that was relatively high paying because I would always have that sense of dissatisfaction, like knowing what else I could be doing. So contracting kind of became like a perfect storm. It gave me all of it at once. So I, I just went contracting. And, and I think for me, that was probably the best career decision I ever made because in a really short span of time, I worked for some amazing organizations. Yeah, worked Metropolitan some, Police, you know, Ministry yeah, of Defense. I, yep. And I did some really remarkable projects that, honestly, if I had gone through the permanent route, I probably wouldn't have. um, I always say to people, my career hasn't been in ladder, it's been a jungle. I've done a lot of things, you know, just jump from different places to to all over the place. So I've had really, really interest. I've been fortunate to work on some really interesting projects. This podcast is sponsored by Malay Natural Science. Malay's products are inspired by the rich landscapes, alluring scents, and ancient wisdom of Africa. Their luxurious fragrance and body care range balances 100% natural active ingredients and scientifically proven formulas to heal, protect, and pamper your skin. Malay ships worldwide, and you can buy their products at maleeonline.com. They also offer a free sample if you'd like to try. So where does then sister sister the idea and i guess for for people who don't know what sister sister is can you help us share what sister sister is it's it's a network of 10,000 plus members now yeah so including your africa launch yeah yes the sister sister network is a 
you know, we're an organisation for women. We run quite a lot of inspiring, educative programmes across the UK initially. And we obviously, that's how we met some of our workshops. And I'll just start, I'll talk a little bit about where, why or where I started that. Um, but essentially, that's what we do, a women's organisation. We do a lot of networking, but also empowerment through educational programmes. You know, bring some really inspiring speakers together. Skills um, training. And forums. do some skills training here and there. Um, work with quite a lot of young leaders as well across some of the you know universities to sort of educate them about leadership and also give them a platform to share their voice and things like that so our primary aim is to you know contribute to gender equality through empowering women you know at, at the grassroots level so we're very grassroots we're going to like communities like birmingham leeds and we would run these forums with locals in that area so while you're not doing your phd not being a lawyer but contracting yes. as a project <laughs> manager you yes. birth you birthed the idea of Sister Sister. Exactly. How that. and why? Actually, I birthed quite a lot of ideas around that time. Bless him. My husband is the most supportive person in my life. There is nothing I must I say, want I have birth. met him. He is lovely. Oh, God. He's just mm. constantly saying, yes, do that. So around that time, I birthed the idea of some sort of chat, uh, photography. So I was photographing, um, I was photographing new bonds. <laughs> and and then I blogged uh, I blogged as well and he was like yes you know do that blog and then what what led to sister sister was actually me sitting down on my own and just going because I had just had my son and before I had my son I had a miscarriage so I think it was just a very um turbulent time for me but I felt like other than church is there anywhere I can actually go and just have a chat with people about this kind of things but also have a chat with people about work so because you know it's that old self piece isn't it where you don't want to break and then I couldn't really find so I thought you know I'm just going to create something um so I never um when I started the sister sister network I never thought it would be what it is today honestly I just started it to have a group of women to have conversations with to chit chat, have a really nice meal. You know, you, you know, I love food. <laughs> so I, there's nothing that makes me happier than great conversation over great food. Ooh, and good I food. Could, I I'm could with you. just die peacefully. So I wanted something where we could have great food and great communication and, you know, just have some interesting topics and stuff. And that's how the network started. I did the first one with a couple of my friends and then the sec- by the time we did the second one, people had started to hear about it within the um, Thames Valley. So people were already kind of like coming forward asking, oh, well, what's this about? So it was just once a year at that time, you know, just catching up every now and again. It was in 2018 that I met someone who had said to me, oh my God, the network is amazing. What do you want from it? And what more do you want to do? And I went, you know, I've never actually sat down to do a lot of thinking beyond the one event or two events we do every year. So I did some fact finding, interviewed some people, and I found that, oh, actually people would love to have what we do, which is one, a networking community, but that is very, very blended, very diverse, very multi-layered, but also they would love to have some sort of tangible information transfer sessions happening. I went, oh, great, so we can stand up these forums. So it was really in 2018, June 2018, that the network kind of became what it is today when we started to do all those forums across the country um, and then start to onboard partners and people who supported our vision and things like that. You say that casually, but, you know, you got quite big names supporting the network now. You know, you've got, at one point you had NatWest, the bank, yeah, so we've got NatWest, we've got Sahid Business School, um, we've got Youthspire, uh, we've got quite Connor, we've got, you know, different people doing different things, but our headline sort of sponsors are NatWest and Sahid, because they're the ones that really kind of help us to amplify and all of that kind of work. So over time, the network just took a life of, life of its own, so I felt like I even had to, I had to catch up with it. But the vision has always been the same. You know, it's just to connect people. And one of the things that I really love, the you know, I'm very proud of that we've been able to achieve, has just been that multi-layer and multiculturalism within the network. So you've got people from everywhere. Honestly, our last event we had people from Spain, China, whatever. You know, people coming in, and then you also have women at different levels of leadership. So we have some really 
very senior leaders. We have women like yourself, Zizi, who have, you know, paved the way for other people who've done, you know, a lot in that business space. And then we have women who are literally just trying to figure out, you know, what should I even do next? Yeah, where do I begin? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And, and I guess while you're doing this, you're still contracting. Yes, I am. I am. But then in between, you decide that you want to become a leadership and diversity coach. <laughs> yes. No. Um, so I, um, uh, I, yeah, and then you know also go to, go to INSEAD and Oxford. <laughs> yes. Like... Just because you can, you know, I think at my core, I'll always be an academic. I, I think so. I can't do a year without doing some sort of study. So and I think probably I should just go back and do my PhD. Maybe that would just, you know, really get to that age. But what, yeah, just, what it yeah, is. Just scratch is... it nicely. Yeah. I, I enjoy my work as a project manager. I've taken a break from it now. I, might, I think I will go back at some point, you know, because I I enjoy it. Like I, 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 you know, but I also, because my kids are growing older, I, there's a degree of, see, project management is quite intense. And it, because, especially as you move towards go live and, you know, all those kind of things. And what I find was that I sometimes was so pressured at work that I didn't really have the time for my kids the way I wanted to have the time for them. And contracting is also quite nuanced in the sense that you can't just take off. <laughs> no. Know? You can't just go There's wow. no days off in, in a traditional yes. employment exactly. model. Yeah. And even if you're working you know, for a year, it's one year straight. It's one year. And even though you can say, oh, I'm taking this week off, it, it's not. it's not like they'll tell you not to. But the expectation is not that you go off as critical points on the project you know it's kind of like it doesn't look good on your personal brand so i and i'm a bit of a perfectionist in the sense that if i'm going to do something i i do want to do it really well so i do commit myself greatly to whatever i am doing and so i found that it was just getting really tricky my daughter who's now going to be eight you know, has quite a lot. She's got a very busy life in school. Oh, yeah, they're so busy. <laughs> mm. And I found I was struggling to go for this, go for that, go for this, go for that. So I then started to reduce my contracting actually gradually. I started to do like maybe two months here, three months there, the break in where I could and stuff. So, and then because of the work that I'd done with the network and in the community generally, people were always coming to me to ask me to speak about diversity anyways. Um, so I was doing quite a lot of freelance speaking about intersectionality, especially being, you know, black, but being a black woman of African, you know, well, being a black African woman. In black a way. lives matter, but black women's lives matter too. You know what I mean? Yes, <laughs> that kind of that intersection between yeah. that or being black, but also being, you know, our race, gender, mm-hmm. and ethnicity all overlaps all that, that, adds, that adds a whole new level to it all <laughs> and you're kind of like okay i'm black but also african so i thought okay let me investigate this a little bit more i was more going to do a lot of work in diversity through the lens of gender and then i was really fascinated with the facts and the data and the models and, and how identity shapes experience and all of that. So I continued sort of probing, probing it, probing it. And then I found that actually, I really, really, really like this, you know, and because I'd done quite a lot of work, you know, also within the network, mentoring people or working with organizations who wanted to develop their leadership pipeline, it kind of felt organic that I could continue to do that. Um, So I tested it last year from March, and then I got quite a good response. Like a lot of people really wanted to understand that intersectionality piece. Around that time, the UK government was talking about the gender pay gap and how they were going to get all organizations to be more transparent. So a lot of people were coming to me and asking me, what do you think we should do? What do you think we should do? So then I thought, oh, great. Oh, yeah, you know what? Now could be the time for me to start inclusivity. So I started inclusivity, but because I was still contracting, there was so little I could do. I was trying to build the brand, you know, uh, put word out there. I gotten someone to do the website and all of that kind of stuff but my mind was still very much on my um the contract i was working on but towards december i kind of you know knew i was going to take a break anyways from project management for contracting but it was actually more to just stay at home with the kids and just you know just see what 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 else you know but as soon as um i started to wind down from that contract Oh, you know, there was just a lot of work coming in around inclusivity because at that time, before COVID-19, the, the, the gender pay gap conversations had moved so, had been accelerated. 
And then COVID-19 happened. I had stopped work by then. And then Black Lives Matter happened. And well, it's before, been... before those two movements, there was the diversity and inclusion movement, right? Yes. Like there was yeah. that now in organizations coming exactly. to the fore. Yeah. Now, but at what point do you decide, okay, I'm going to be a trained learning and development consultant? I think last year. So I, I, I have a personal coach who I do quite a lot of work with who kind of helps me more with my sort of communication and, you know, how I articulate my ideas and things like that. And one of the things that we had done was we had done an exercise around visioning and what I really wanted for myself. And if money wasn't, because obviously one of the key things you always think about as a contractor is, oh, what else can I do that's going to give me this money? You know, you, money would always be at the forefront of any career decision you make. Uh, and we talked about what what would you do, ignore money. And I said, you know what, I, since I was young, I am, I've been told and I know that I am a great teacher. And generally, I can teach most people anything. Cue in, cue in homeschooling during COVID. <laughs> you know, so I kind of always knew I would do something in the long run in my life around teaching. And I suppose one of the reasons I enjoyed my PhD so well was that I was also a teaching assistant. So I was doing quite a lot of teaching undergrads and college students and stuff. So that kind of, so when I, the more I worked on that visioning, the more it emerged that even in my project management career, the best part of, it for me was that education piece so I also you know this is a very individual journey in terms of how you know it's time to leave your nine to five for me my life has been quite fast paced so I knew I was never one of good I was never going to be one of those people whose decisions would be based on age you know, I've never, my life has never gone that way. I'm not one of those people that say, oh, by the time I'm 40, I'm going to return. You know, like, it's never been that way for me. So I wasn't, uh, there was no date. There was no, it was just a gut feeling. I knew that when I got to that point, I will know. And I don't even see it necessarily because a friend of mine was saying to me, so have you quit your career? I went, you, I, you know what, um, you can be multi-layered. If that's one career, <laughs> you know, you can go back. You're not, you don't lose your skills, right? You could go back to it in 10 years' time. But for right now, I just want to add another focus on. And no experience is ever wasted, right? And exactly. I, and I think there's something about the thought of being okay to, to, to want to pursue something else. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And not just say, no, don't define yourself. For me, that was something that I've always felt strongly is that I don't define myself by what I do or what I don't do. I don't go around identifying as a project manager, you know? <laughs> uh, so for me, it was very easy to say, okay, I'm just going to put that to the side because there's so much more that I am. And I'm always curious to find, even within the organizations I've worked, some of my past employers have become my customers at inclusivity. Because I've gone back to them to say, hey, I'm doing this. Do you have any, you know, need or whatever around there? So for me, I don't think I've done a hard transition where I've said I'm never looking back, you know, but I've taken a break. And I think that that break is for me to find out. It's so difficult when you're in that nine to five mindset to your most productive hours are gone by the time you get back home and then you can't wait for the weekend so that you can at least bond with your family or you know I don't know do your hair or do something so there is no time to really step back and ask yourself some you know key questions around what do I really want in the long run well blah 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 so I feel like for me I felt it was needed. I, I, last year, I decided I needed that time to think and to just step away from all of it and to come back with whatever it is. It was what I didn't know at that time whether I was going to, you know, maybe just say, okay, I need a break and then I'll go back or I want to do something completely different. But the work that I do at Inclusivity for me right now is so fulfilling because when I think about my personal strengths, it plays so well into it. So it doesn't feel like work so much. And also there's that flexibility because for me, the ultimate aim is to be flexible enough to be more present as a parent, as a mom, to be very, very present. And the thing I'm sure, you know, you understand this as much as I do is the more they, as they grow older, they, they, their needs change, but they become more intense. 
So it becomes less possible to just say, leave me alone, I'm busy to, uh, to a child who's growing up. And they're looking at you like, okay, but I'm important too. So you can get away with certain things when they don't really have their own minds and they're still very impressionable. But as they grow older and they become more um, mature in the way they think, they do need that time, you know, and that's just, it's just, a, I have been one of those people that I've always said, no, you can have both. Yes, you can have both career and be a parent, but you've got to be aware that there will be sometimes be tension. So you can't just go into yeah. it blindly and, thinking and, there's no and tension. And you really need that village. You, yeah, exactly. you are going to need that village to make yeah. it, to make it happen. To make and it through. <laughs> you, you will, you will. Yeah. And, you know, I think one of my biggest revelations in the last year I went to one of the book uh, launches they had in London. A friend kindly invited me along with her to, you know, the Trillion Dollar Coach. Right. Yeah, I think I've seen um, that book. on my LinkedIn. Yes. And I sat there and I think for the first time, that was the first time I realized that the people we idolize in terms of success stories they're not doing this alone. They literally have an army. They have coaches. They have the support at home. They have the support within their careers. They have the support from every angle, angle. which allows them. <laughs> literally, I, I think, call it naivety, right? But there was a part of me, and 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 maybe the same with you. I perhaps that's probably why we connected so much. Which is, you know, warrior woman, right? You can mm, do it mm, all, have it all, mm, be it all, mm, mm, mm. Um, and also not realizing that actually there's something missing in that version. The version that you should be hearing is actually the people who are doing it all, having it all, etc. Warriors have a whole battalion. Uh, helping them achieve that. And what you said just reminded me of that so much, which was, you know, how do you prioritize, you know, parenting, because that's the most important job, as well as the service and the work that you're doing, whether it's with Sister Sister or with inclusivity. Um, you just reminded me strongly about about that. Sorry, I, I felt the need to. Yeah. And, and people ask me, no, 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 I think you're absolutely right because this is actually something that I'm quite passionate about is to not tell the single story. People ask me a lot, how do you juggle it all? You know, they're like, oh, how do you juggle? But it's like, I'm not alone. The first thing you have to recognize is that my husband is a key player in the parenting all thing. So when you ask me how I juggle it, it's like you're assuming that I'm the only one juggling the kids. Oh. <laughs> well, because because by and large, for some people, that is the construct, right? The, the woman is left doing the heavy lifting and, and then the man goes off to, I don't know, other stuff. Find I'm, du money. I am <laughs> very fortunate is, in the sense that yeah. my husband is a very hands-on parent. He's a very deliberate parent. He went into parenting with the mindset that he wanted to be a really present parent. So it, it, it gives him quite a lot of fulfillment to be with the kids. I'm actually a huge advocate of parental leave um, um, for, for, for the dads because the two occasions of becoming a mom for me has not gone the way I wanted it to go, it hasn't been smooth. If my husband hadn't been there, <laughs> honestly, I don't know what we're talking about today. So I think that it's very important that we say all of this in its full it's not just like you wake up one, you know, like that, oh, you woke up like this. Actually, no, you don't wake up yeah. like this. You wake up yeah. a mess and then, yeah. um, <laughs> and then your sister chips in, your husband yeah. chips in, your friends yeah. chip in, your mentors yeah. chip in. And then by midday, you kind of start to look a little bit flawless. Yeah. So it, it takes, it takes an harmony. And even now my kids, me being a parent, me being a woman, my sister is such a huge part of my life a lot of the kind of confidence that one needs to be in leadership positions doesn't always come organically. And I think that's why Sheryl Samba came under a lot of fire for leaning because it, it's in parts, I kind of got the message and I liked the book, but in parts it told a single story on the assumption that everybody just has this, you know, life. But actually for a lot of us, it's, it's and as I said, it's tension of knowing you're in a meeting but actually your child is in school waiting for you. Or it's knowing that you're at the school with your child, 
but actually you're missing a critical business meeting. And it's being able to come to terms that, with the fact that that is just a journey rather than you thinking that everybody just kind of like puts on, I, I say something though, like, it, within the network, we've had all sorts of speakers, including yourself. And everybody always asks me after the, the, the talk, how did I do? Because everyone's nervous. Like we all have that in our in, in, innate vulnerability. And I think you'll be doing a disservice to women in general, but certainly to women of color. If you said, oh, everything was just swimming. It's tough. It really, really is tough. My my friend or my friend says to me, "It's tough on these streets, man." Yeah, <laughs> you know, it, yeah. It's, it's tough. And when you're balancing being a mom on top of everything, being a being a wife on top of everything, and being a Nigerian for me, where my I've got very strong cultural values, very very strong cultural values that manifest every day. You just have to make sure that you're aware of what you're doing and you get the support. I, as I said, I've been coached almost every week for about four years. I do quite a lot of self-reaffirming activities because it doesn't just happen organically. You need that support. You need, it's going to be too much if you don't find support. Agreed. Agreed. I'm I'm a huge advocate of putting in the work when it comes to your emotional development. Um, it plays such a huge part in our sense of self. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. and it plays a huge part in how you do business. And and I wonder why, I guess by and large, it's not something that's talked about often enough, but like I was Mm. saying, I was sitting at this thing at the trillion dollar coach. And for the first time it hit me that all of these CEOs who had had huge celebratory success, by the way, are not entrepreneurs. They are Mm -hmm. workers in companies, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but none, Mm. you know, Nonetheless, look, the likelihood of you becoming a millionaire or more successful mm. is, is, is higher in employment than it is mm. in entrepreneurship. Mm. Mm-hmm. People don't know um, that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the statistics are actually um, otherwise. So for the entrepreneurs who do make it and who are able to, especially with vision-led projects, who are able to then do purposeful work, it takes a lot. It takes a lot of, of, of toll. And your choice of being able to speak around effective leadership and gender and diversity and intersectionality and how, you know, the challenges that companies are facing, right? Take Black Lives Black Lives Matter. And just most companies perhaps didn't even have to question, but knew they had a challenge attracting and managing a diverse workforce. So they just never did because, you know, the the requirements to have a cultural shift Mm, seemed like too big a task, right? Mm -hmm, Like for mm -hmm. for, for most of them, right? Mm -hmm, And so, mm -hmm. you know, I, I remember my first experience of walking into a professional setting and perhaps maybe that's, that's one of the things that actually discouraged me from employment in the same way you, because there was a part of my identity that I wasn't comfortable not being because you almost had to be neutral yeah. to survive. Beige. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, re- I remember also, um, I used to have a big Afro in 2008, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And I remember when I was finishing my master's program and I remember the conscious thought that I had, I would have to straighten my hair to, to go back in, into employment. Um, and there were just certain aspects that I, I just wasn't comfortable with. And I guess in terms of speaking more about the work you do with diversity and inclusion and the consulting that you do and the intersectionality, like to the lay person who doesn't understand what that work does for companies moving forward do you mind sharing that yes absolutely so my my work is in two is in two strands the first one is really around the broad concept of diversity which i always say is about kind of getting people through the door in certain industries that's still a challenge the the actual being i mean one of my clients was saying to me last week we just can't find you know a multicultural workforce within this particular specific genre like this specific industry so i suppose you think about it that no in 2020 we're in england or in america wherever you can find you know biologists or whatever wherever 
for some industries, they're not mainstream yet. So if you think about some of these industries only recruit from like five or six universities every year. So the thing, the, the thing about the resources they get is that it's so dependent on who goes to those universities. There's just so many layers in terms of access. And um, so attraction, you're not even at the gates of attraction yet because you can only attract what is there, right? So we need to, first of all, help organizations to look at non-mainstream talent pools where you can get the same level of, you know, expertise, intelligence and innovation and creativity and all of that. But maybe it's just not coming from, say, Oxbridge. Yeah. So that that's one big aspect. So it's that diversity. So some of my clients are still struggling, to, but maybe it's just not coming from sailing to get people of color or people, you know, or be attractive to people with disabilities or different abilities and all of that. So that's the first sort of strand then the second strand is more around the experience of work which is where things like intersectionality inclusion belonging and things because for some organizations right the challenges are in three folds the first is yes they get these people in but q5 years they're all gone <laughs> you know the the turnover rate is so high um and when obviously that means the organization is generally spending more money on resourcing you know, because they train people, they leave, and then it's just an endless vicious cycle. Or secondly, the people stay, but they're so disengaged. You know, the Gallup poll from a couple of years ago said that only 8% of adults in the British workforce were engaged at work. I mean, fully switched on, engaged at work. And we know that a sense of belonging and inclusion plays a critical part in that whole engagement piece. So you've got that second group of people who, they do manage to attract diversity, but then just kind of there's a leaky pipeline somewhere and people go and then you've got the third ones which is they get the diversity to an extent the people don't go but they never make it anywhere you know this is where you'd hear people who have been in an organization for 18 years never been trained never been promoted and so when you look at that and that's only happening within your uh, the protected groups within your organization you are, you know, obviously losing talent and creativity because you're not even looking there. So for for me, the work that I do at Inclusivity is to bear in mind all those things I just mentioned now, to look at the context of an organization and then look at where the challenges are because typically where the challenges are, the opportunities are. And so if an organization says to me, we just can't find a female exec, you know, we just, we just, we've searched high and low, but we just can't find a female exec. Or they, some of them are even more honest and they will say, we're just really struggling to get diversity on our board to reflect, you know, the society that we operate in. So we then look at the strategy around why might that be? Are you, is it, the, is, are you advertising to the wrong places? Or so it, it's quite, you know, people think DNI is just, you know, blah, 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 it's all fluffy, but it's actually quite technical because you look at the, the numbers in terms of is the failure happening at the point where they, they, so do you have like 80% or, or do you get, like, do you have like 80 to 20% within the people that apply and then 20% are only women, 80 are men, for example. And then from application stage to selection stage for interview, does that number drop? Because then you know, okay, I've got a problem somewhere in my selection. And then that's where you focus all your energy on. You look at how the selection criteria may be biased against those certain groups and how those biases are perpetrating themselves. Or is it that they make it to interview stage and then they just don't get the offer? And then you look again at that stage. Or is it that they get the offer, but then they come into work, high potential women or men or whoever, and then over a year or two, they leave because they don't feel included and engaged and embedded within the organization. So when you spotlight the area of challenge, then you build a systemic response to that challenge and help the organization to overcome it. And that can be working with some of our partners in recruitment. We work with a couple of niche recruitment firms who specialize in recruiting people from underrepresented groups. Or do you need to even help them to search for new recruitment um, partners? Or do you need to work with their recruitment partners and educate them about how bias perpetrates itself in recruitment quite subtly? So it's quite a lot to look at. But the ultimate end game is that we want people to have a workforce reflective of their talent pool. Nobody is, I say, I have a couple of clients here and there in the, in Asia. Nobody is expecting you to miraculously find 
Because when people talk about diversity, the first thing people think about is people of color, or people of, you know, it, it's, be, it's that, but it's also bigger than that. Because if you're a, if we judge it only by color, then if you're a black gay person, you will find job, right? Because yeah. if, if that whole sense of diversity is beyond one's um, category of identity. It's just the willingness to allow talent flow from wherever it can flow. So we look at the cultural context, but then we also look at the fact that if you are, if your talent pool is 80 to 20 percent so 80 women 20 men or 80 white 20 black nobody's expecting your organization to suddenly have the flip you know because where are you going to get them from so what we're really asking for is a tal is a workforce that reflects the talent pool so if there are 20 percent or 40 percent of gynecologists across the uk who are black then you should be able to see those 40 percent in most nhs hospitals that's what we're trying to get to is that balance where people don't feel excluded from the recruitment pipeline just because of their social categorization so it's um each company has their own unique challenges but what i tend to do my own approach is to focus in on the area of opportunity where it all falls apart and then try to fix that because again the answer is not you know just bringing in a person. I myself, I find myself often being asked to join all sorts of boards. And then I ask why, and then they're looking at me and I'm looking at them and I just realize, oh, all right, okay. It's because I'm black. You know? yeah. <laughs> we'll just whisper that time. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's beyond that. And we don't want to get into that tokenism of just putting people in, but we want to build a culture where people can excel. And also people understand the unique challenges that come in. Again, I, I'm very big on it intersectionality and the intersectional experience even within communities you know um i was watching a, a really powerful program on netflix about colorism a couple of days ago and um you know, I found that really interesting that even within the cultural context of Nigerians, we have all these layers. So it's just to educate people, I guess, intersectionality is that A is not always A for everybody. For some, it's a cursive A. <laughs> for some, it's a straight A and then things like that. Because if we don't understand this, we'll be frustrated because you will keep thinking we have all this BAME initiatives. What mm. is happening? You know? Again, but BAME being black. BAME, um, uh, um, black, Asian, minority, ethnic. Like, like, yeah. And, and it's problematic oh Who because... Who comes up with this stuff? <laughs> I know, right? Because what is that? There is no common mm-hmm. BAME experience. So mm-hmm. intersectionality is what you used to dispel that, to say within a very system that is meant to benefit people from underrepresented groups, it might still exclude certain people because they have an extra layer of identity. Like you could be black, female, gay, and disabled, and in your 60s. So what does that mean for employment? So things like that is is really what we we look at. And and so far, the response, as you said, there is a consciousness now that the next generation of talent and consumers are value driven. They no longer just purchase from a place of money. It's not all about price. You know, historically, companies can reach people based on their price points, right? They know who they want to. But a lot of people now are recognizing that, okay, the best talent are not just going for the jobs that pay to the highest figures, right? Because there's so many pathways to wealth now. People are looking for fulfillment. They're looking for value. They're looking for vision. And so I think as a lot of organizations are realizing the power of value in their brand, they are now looking at diversity with a new lens because they recognize that for the best talent coming into an organization of 20,000 people and seeing that there are only 50 odd people from ethnic minorities can make them leave. So they don't want those people to leave because that's talent going away. So they're looking at it more seriously. Um, but what we need to do is make sure that it's not performative and people are not just um, tokenism, right? looking at it to be seen to be looking at it, but that they're actually investing in the time and the commitment to change because it will mean changing the systems, not just um, the things we say. It's actually making sure that whenever we go through a recruitment cycle and we couldn't find a single person of color, we go back and ask ourselves what happened. 
rather than just accepting that we gave the best man for we gave the job to the best man when we know that the best man itself is subjective who defines that right so yeah so that's sort of what 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 I do and it's um it's interesting I really enjoy it and also it's very fulfilling because when I see my clients moving forward um edging closer to their targets it's very satisfying and so you gave a TED talk on inclusive leadership, which lends itself to, to a lot of this. And so anyone can find it online. But in I touched on going back to, to school and, and doing, <laughs> doing a course yeah. at Oxford. <laughs> but you've also had partnerships with, you know, the UN, Oxford University, UK Parliament, UNICEF on, cam- on campus. And you've been voted as one of the 145 inspiring leaders in 2020, especially when it's focused on sort of diversity and inclusivity. But your passion is really for closing the gap, whether that's closing the gap as a woman, closing the gap as a minority, as, again, I I hate the term minority because it, you know, in in certain parts of the world, I'm not a minority as a black woman. You know (laughs) what I mean? Actually, statistically, Mm. I'm in the majority. But for context, yes. But I, I think by and large, what would you say you're finding your mission to be now? Because, you know, you, you, you're you not closing a door, any door to any of your talents, right? Which Which is almost the beauty of 2020 living, right? Which is you are allowed to be project manager slash yes. speaker slash slash <laughs> Dog slash walker, right? whatever no mother you know diaper changer yep. homework teacher yep. cook uh, like that's the benefit of 2020 right and and also being comfortable stepping outside of the mold that says actually if someone says what do you do you know the you, you should only have one thing there's also the, the the thought of how do you manage, I guess, financially having to, because some of these projects are projects that you have to invest in and self-fund before you get to a point where you can find yes, partnerships, where you get funded, yeah. mm-hmm. et cetera. Mm-hmm. There's, also, there's also that. So how have you been able to juggle the financial part of everything that you're doing? Because think- it's a lot planning okay i start when i started the network my husband was the one who invested in the network to be fair um mm. he kind of was our first sponsor i always say he's the brother <laughs> in the sister system network yeah um, amazing and then i started to i do you know what it's crazy at some point the sister system network was taking 50 percent of my salary wow um yeah how much 50 percent at some point Wow. Especially when we're trying to build infrastructure around the network. Wow. Um, so, but w- the way I see things is if you don't believe in something, you have no business doing it. You can't start something and immediately start looking for sponsors. If you cannot sponsor yourself, <laughs> yep. who will sponsor Best believe you? no one is sponsoring <laughs> you. <laughs> so the first person that has to go forward, you know, and pave the way to say, hey, I believe in this idea, is you. So you have to walk the walk and talk the talk until you can get other people aboard. What I did, was determined about was that it wouldn't take too long. But I knew that to build a lasting legacy, to do something that I would be proud of, that I can say to my daughter, hey, look at what I did. I needed to commit not only my time and my energy, but my money. So that was the angle that I looked at it from. So in a way, I did whatever needed to be done to set the network up. As time goes on, obviously, Zizi, you probably know this more than me because you're more of an entrepreneur. You then start to be strategic, right? One of the things that I talk to young women about, especially young women from, you know, um, our background, is the power of the value of pricing, you know, because we, you, then you you determine the model that works for you. And often you probably want to do a low volume, even, but high price. So that even if it's just one partner you get in a year, that is okay to put the lights on, to keep the lights on, right? And to make sure that the network continues to run itself. Rather than spreading yourself thin, trying to reach 10,000 people that will give you a pound each or something. So for me, the strategy has been very much geared towards what can be easily achieved 
in terms of without me necessarily leaving my house. And also, I run a volunteer-based team that support me at the network. What can they support us with? And within all of that accessibility, how can we make the most money? And that's how I kind of, I always think, how can you, even in your career, how can you make the most money? Because when you can sell one product and still say, okay, that's good, it's easier. When you're trying to juggle so many things, but they're all not priced properly, you'll be exhausted because to break even will feel like an insurmountable task. But if you price it properly, if you think critically about what, and I get it that for a lot of women, pricing themselves in terms of their skills, their services properly, it's um, it's it difficult. As I said, even I've had to be coached about it. But yeah. be, knowing how much you're worth. But I find it also is because you, you, one, really know how much you're worth, not from an underpriced perspective, but also sometimes from an overpriced perspective, know exactly. what the market actually is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And in agreement with you, have people that you can have these conversations with openly. You know? Exactly. I'm about to ask you conversations around partnerships when we're done because, you know, at, you know, <laughs> because that's not something I do often, right? Mm, so mm, mm. Th- these are t- to have resources. And I guess that's why the Sister Sister Network is great because you have opportunities to have these conversations and people exactly. are happy to share. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and I think that's just for me the, the secret is that I think about every year how much do I need to run the network to survive to do whatever and then what is the smartest way to get that money what is the absolute smartest way to get it not just what do I want to do what makes me happy yeah but what is the smartest thing to do and in terms of the question that you asked earlier on um, around what have I discovered you know as I'm growing older. I've always had an old soul, you know, (laughs) but so it's taken my body away in a way years to catch up in my mind. But what I've found is that we're such incredibly powerful beings. A lot of us don't even know how powerful we are. We don't know. Aren't we only supposed to be using like a small percentage of our brain capacity? I know, but you know, the thing is, if that's, if we can achieve that with that small percent, right? Imagine what you could achieve with actually maybe 50% of the brain capacity. But beyond that, imagine what you could achieve if you saw yourself in a different light. If you just saw yourself in a completely different light. And I think for me, what I've discovered is that it's taken me 30 odd years to get here, but I have finally found my sweet spot. And that sweet spot tells me every day, you can do it. You've got what it takes. You know, I I didn't go to an Ivy League university. I mean, now I've obviously I'm doing a course at Said. I went to University of my degree from my undergraduate. <laughs> you know, that is a great uni. Don't get me wrong, but it's certainly you know, and all of those things built barriers in my head. I felt my name was too long. <laughs> I know. I, I have a segment in the podcast where I ask people to say their names. So oh, we're about to get God. to your name, by the yeah. way, dear. So I felt it, it's going to, you know, I had all these things in my head that I convinced myself were going to be challenges. And so they held me back from creatively thinking of how I could achieve all of my dreams. But the moment that you let them go and you start to see yourself in those dreams, see yourself running that business, even though you're still in nine to five. See yourself being part of that social change, even though you're still outside the club in a way. See yourself achieving those things. Honestly, when you see yourself differently, you will find your own version of how you should do it. It won't be the way Zizi did it. It won't be the way Adukia did it. Like, I've found what works for me. Zizi has found what works for her. You will find what works for you. And it won't be because somebody said something. It'll come from within, but you need to see yourself as limitless, as endless. You know, you know when you go to all the shops and they say you have endless drinks, right? Mm. It means you can do whatever. Bottomless, bottomless, bottomless. Drink. Sorry, yeah, bottomless. So you kind of have to see yourself as a bottomless pool of talent and skill. And so when one thing is not working. You'll have the courage to say, man, um, I'll be back, but let me just go over here. Oh, you just touched on this whole skill thing. I think the assumption that skills just, uh, you know, there's something about raw talent and there's something about skill. 
And I think there's something in our educational system that perhaps needs addressing, right? Mm, Because, mm. you know, is our is our educational system rewarding skill or are they rewarding raw talent? Because I I don't think that the people who are upskilling actually get the recognition. And speaking of skill, there's something in the journey that requires you to put in the hours to get the outcome. And I don't think that's talked about enough. And I love the fact that you've just touched on it. I think resilience is definitely something that should be taught in schools. Mm. And the fact that it takes a while, generally, <laughs> to get anything yeah, good out of we, anything. We, we, <laughs> we underestimate the time it takes too, you know. It There's does. this assumption mm. that you should you should be raking in, you know, millions or that yes. actually success always looks like, like this. Su- yes. oh. su- success looks in so many different ways. And I hope with each episode of the podcast, I'm able to showcase and show people as you say, a multi-layered story, especially for our especially for our communities, because I feel so strongly about the barriers we build in our minds from sort of cultural norms passed on to us about what that looks like and the fact that actually you can be slash 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 (laughs) you know and be happy. (laughs) And be happy. And you can stumble, you can find different ways you can you know there's something about being a great beautiful person that doesn't come from having no stumbling blocks or no it's like the greatest stories of the people we admire the most have had to survive so through many some dark. adversity mm, mm, you know mm, like it's mm. part of the if you were perfect every time if you got an a on every test if you finished that phd if you like you wouldn't be here and you wouldn't be doing the work in the way that you're doing it now. And I Absolutely. think that is And so I think your important. darkest moments, your darkest, absolute darkest moments are probably the most pivotal, pivotal points of your life anyways. You know, I, I, you know, I lost sort of, you know, quite a lot of things in, in along the way. And, you know, and even now, I want you still to, life is just starting for you to know what else the future holds. But the reality is, as long as you're here, and I'm a really spiritual person, I believe that all of this are part of the plan and every day is, and what you said is so powerful about success looking so different because I find that one of the things that will meet, give you the most unfulfilling life ever is if you never quite define for yourself what success is. Because if you're always measuring what success is by money, that means whenever you don't have money, you'll feel like a failure. If you're always measuring success by the number of people that are liking your posts on social media or the people that are calling your, themselves your friends, that means that when you're going through this period of, like, of loneliness, you'll feel like a failure. But if you define success as an internal journey of fulfillment and resilience, of trying your very God-given best every time, no matter where you are, no matter what you're going through, you'll be able to look in the mirror and say, I am try my best and for me that's success being able to say i've given everything i can i have used all my gifts i have been a great mom you know hopefully (laughs) my my cousin was saying the other day that we need to keep some therapy funds for the children (laughs) hopefully we'll come to that yeah And I can look back on my journey and just say... Let's not even get into generational trauma. That's that's like a favorite of mine. Oh, no, that's another, po- let, that's another <laughs> podcast. That will... We'll need to Dizzy, I won't be able to do that podcast alone. I will need to invite my sister because we will need to get into it. So, <laughs> so as long as I can manage to do that, I would look back in my life and I would say... It's been a really successful thing. And my career and the choices I've made, the relationships I've built, I mean, with people like you, you know, just looking across, seeing what you're doing, building this badass community of inspiring women my my daughter can look up to. For me, those are everyday successes. And I'm just really blessed to be there. Fabulous. Well, Aduke, uh, can you tell everyone how your name is said properly? (laughs) It's Aduke. My full name is actually Aduke Oke, which means peacock, bizarrely. But it's Aduke or Nofowoko. Fabulous. I'm sure I'm sure you've had other ver- oh, <laughs> That's another podcast. <laughs> other versions. Um, and where can everyone find you? 
You can find me mostly on LinkedIn. I uh, I think that's my favorite social media hangout spot. So LinkedIn, but we also have social media pages for the Sister Sister Network um, on Instagram, on Facebook. I don't really have a lot of personal social media, but in terms of LinkedIn, it's probably the best place to, to find me. Or through Zizi. <laughs> well, yeah, it'll be in the show notes um, and there'll be links to, to, to all Educa's platforms. And if you're interested in chopping it up more around um, effective leadership, gender, diversity, inclusion, her consulting uh, company, Inclusivity, is, is out there and working across the globe. Well, Educa, thank you so much for joining us on this week's episode. Oh, thank you, Zizi. I have loved chatting with you. It didn't even feel like a podcast. It just felt like we were hanging out. The only thing missing... It was our normal chat. <laughs> the only thing missing is just a really good meal. This would have just yeah. been everyone. <laughs> <laughs> fabulous well thank you so much for joining us lovely thank you thank you for listening to this episode of third culture africans the lifestyle podcast we would love to hear from you so please find us on facebook or instagram at third culture africans and leave us a comment a review goes a long way in getting our show notice so please leave us one if you enjoyed this episode and we'll see you next time